And what I talk about all the time is not trying to get the pets to do things, but rather educate the owners as to how the pet thinks and uh, set the house up so that it's suitable for them to actually uh, have relaxed behaviours. Welcome to the Aussie Ambitions Podcast. We are very excited to have a guest with us today who actually has a sidekick. His name is Murphy, and our guest today is Ron Pia. How are you, Ron? Oh, good. Thank you. Great to be here. So Ron is in the world of canine lifestyle consulting. He's the founder of the Pet Calmer, um, and also he's got a project called Pet Tunes. So we're going to look at all of this today. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Ron? Uh, sure. Yeah, look, I'm, uh, I'm an old fella. Um, many years ago, when I was a lot younger, I started uh, an interest in dogs. And uh, when I was about 13, I was actually started showing, showing Cocker Spaniels and became pretty efficient in uh, grooming. And I had a, uh, gro a grooming service at home. Now, uh, that's where my dog's interest started. But uh, I was a bit of a lonesome child. You know, I didn't mix, mix very well. And I spent a lot of time with my Spaniels and it's only now in these latter years of my life that I've actually learned what they actually taught me. Um, I have uh, the ability to talk to dogs, learn, uh, work with their behaviours and solve their owner's uh, problem behaviours. Okay. So, and, and is that something that um, uh, you've got a large number of large number of animals? Is it just canines or you, you look beyond uh, that? Uh, well, I'm working now with cats as well, uh, particularly with anxiety uh, in that aspect. But you mentioned about the Pet Karma, and that is a uh, business that's uh, solely dedicated to animal anxiety. And we uh, have natural solutions for calming anxiety in uh, dogs, cats, horses, and and pet birds. Okay. We uh, we definitely enjoyed going through your website to just get up to speed with this because it's one of those topics where people are probably not, actually maybe they are researching for themselves if they have a noticed a problem in their behavior, but do you find that people are coming to you in a mode of desperation or is it more like curiosity about, I've noticed this problem? How drastic is it when they're in touch with you? Um, initially it is desperation uh, because People buy puppies, for instance, and they take them home and try to get them to be part of the family. But the, uh, the biggest difficulty pet owners have, or particularly dog owners, is actually understanding how a dog actually works. And the uh, dogs are very visual communicators. They watch their owners very closely for behavioral signals, and often they get confused. And that's what causes the anxiety. Now, people go to their veterinarian, which is the correct thing to do, to try and work out a remedy for this. But it can, and others, you know, try to work it out from friends' recommendations. And that generally aggravates the whole situation. So eventually they come to the stage that they've been through all the treatments and they still haven't solved the problem. And uh, then they'll come looking at, uh, at our products. Okay. Um... And so it's. So you mentioned vets being a point of part of it, of course. Um, oh, it's an important part because you know anxiety is, is can also be tri triggered by medical issues. Right. So, in the, from a holistic point of view, um, do you have to then monitor lots of different things? Maybe be up to speed on their diet or their exercise regime and so on. All of that is part of it. All all of that is part of it. When you're working with animals, um, they're uh, how would I say this? They're like a mechanism. You know, if they've got the right food, the right fuel, they're consuming the right fuel, the dog will actually grow correctly. The organs will grow correctly. The legs will grow correctly. The joints will grow correctly. And they will develop into good, good pets. But if that's not the case, that you're getting issues with like crucial ligaments or joint displacements or um, itchy skin, 
t uh, uh, tummy uh, upsets, you know, the dog is going to start to stress. Mm. So what the veterinarian's job is, is to be the investigator, act and find out and test um, what is actually causing the stress and the anxiety. Now, it may not be anything medical. It can be purely behavioural. And that's why dogs are very sensitive to their environments because that's how they determine their behaviour. Hmm, okay. Um, I'm curious about the, um, uh, obviously there's there's breeds. So dogs. Different, different do, dog breeds, do, yes. Perhaps personalities that come into it or maybe predisposed to high energy or... Um, Look, so uh, the, dog, the reason why we have dog breeds because they've been bred for a purpose. Uh, you know, we have a West Highland Terrier here. This is, this is actually a working dog. Its original dog, dog was to work on the farms uh, in Scotland and, and uh, the upper regions of England. Now, you also have uh, spaniels, which uh, are hunting dogs. They were used for hunting and hounds for uh, flushing out foxes and vermin. And then there's also, say, dogs like Pekingese, Maltese, you know, which are social dogs. So dogs all have a, have a different purpose that they were bred for. That's why we get different shapes and personalities in them. Hmm. And what about uh, from a generational, uh, in, in the breeding sense of if there was a, a line or a breed and the, the parent breed was more was an anxious dog, had some imbalance, and then there was a set of uh, puppies. Would the puppies have any kind of genetic genetic link? Is there anything that you've heard of there? Uh, yeah, look, the, the, because you've got dog breeds, you've got genetics, because that's actually what sort of determines how the puppies are going to form, to, to look like the breed. So, uh, but with uh, genetics, that's, a, that's a, uh, a very scientific area because you can have inbreeding and outbreeding and you've got to watch your genetics because if it's too close, it can produce hereditary problems. But with the, uh, the, the pet dog that we have, uh, say, here on the Gold Coast particularly, it's the same as pet dogs in New York or pet dogs in Africa or pet dogs in Germany, all around the world. All the dogs actually behave the same. They have the same language, which is an interesting thing because, you know, they. I think they've got things worked out a lot better than we do. Look at us. We've got so many languages and we get so confused with each other. But the dog behaviour uh, is, is the same. Now, what happens uh, with our pets is their learning period is really in the the infant puppy stage. You can actually teach a dog from four weeks to 16 weeks everything it needs to know. They're, they're like super sponges at that, that particular time. We separate our puppies out of their litter at eight weeks. So the learning period from eight weeks onwards is dependent on the owners of, of the, uh, the pup. Now, if the owners are not conversant of how a dog learns, they can very easily teach dogs the wrong behaviour. Now, how do, dog, how do we work out whether it's a wrong behaviour or not? The dog doesn't. He does things to get a result. So uh, it's us as people, we determine whether a dog's behaviour is acceptable, <coughs> excuse me, or non-acceptable. The dog has already worked it out that if I do this, I get that. And if that's the best thing I can get, I'll keep doing this. That's interesting. So I, I I noted that you mentioned language, and even in the intro, you were mentioning about communication, and perhaps it's not just um, well, it's maybe perhaps what they see or a tone. Uh, is there one primary, I guess, tool, or are they more receptive to visual cues or smell or just conditioning? Well, let's just take Murphy here when we arrived today in your studio. Right. You know, what did Murphy do? First thing, he, he looked at you and he put his nose to the floor. He searched around and then he suddenly discovered a rubbish bin, which looked very appetizing to him. So he investigated. So they used their, their senses of smell, no, uh, sight, and more importantly, their ears, their hearing. Their hearing is the most sensitive part of what determines their behavior. Because if you've got a, a, a quiet environment like we have here, he's gone to sleep, he's relaxed. Yeah. So 
if we've got a very noisy high-pitched band playing here, he'll be up alert and dancing all over the place, you know, quite anxious. So what they hear actually determines how they're going to respond to the sounds. So really it's all visual things. So when it comes to training your dog, one of the most important things is to take advantage of giving him a calm, calm environment, using the visual so he can focus on what you're, you're trying to teach him. And we're using treats, sense as, as the rewards, you know, to keep that interest up initially. So uh, they, they are very important elements of how the dog, you know, wants to live. And once, um, and you know, I encourage people to actually smile at their dogs, because when they, when you smile, your facial expression changes, and they're watching your your face, your body, and uh, the way that you behave to determine what's going to happen for them next. So when you smile, they become very happy and attentive. Interesting. Um, I am um, thinking about the. Exactly that. So there's a smile, and it's it's, it's triggering a response and a positive, you know, uh, feedback loop, and and so on. So I'm interested in the biology of it. I don't know. Has there been any studies? Oh, there he goes. Yeah, oh, sorry, oh, I'm oh. making a bit of noise. It's all right. You sit here. Woken up. Sit, 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 sit. Um, sit, good sit, job, Murphy. Yeah. Oops. Here we are. Um, um, I was just curious about the, I guess, the world of information that's available on. Um, how people can educate themselves on some of this stuff? Like, is it, are you self-taught or is, is there an institution well, that uh, covers look, this? I, as I mentioned uh, when we first started, I spent a lot of time as a child with my dogs and they are actually the ones that actually taught me pretty well what I know today uh, because we worked together. Uh, we used to do uh, show ring. Uh, we did um, agility trials and we also did um, uh, field we have field trials, so, you know, that's retrieving and gun work. And when you're working with the dogs, you know, you've got to train them. So you find out what's, uh, what's the best way to train them and what, how quickly they can respond to, uh, to a new lesson. So, yeah, my dogs taught me that. And it's interesting, I've gone through life um, uh, as self-employed. I've started many, uh, quite a number of businesses uh, uh, through my life. And now that um, I've actually retired from those businesses, I'm back to actually the behavior of dogs again. That's neat. Um, and how does that feel uh, uh, going through all those phases? I mean, do you, is it more liberating in the sense that you don't have the stress of maybe a business and the overhead and uh, all of that? Yeah, look, the, uh, the businesses, um, or business is always a stress when you have, uh, you know, a number of employees and finances and you go through a credit squeeze and you go through trying to run a business on 25% interest rates and all those sort of things. And, and that's how it has been for the last, you know, 40 years, you know, running, running businesses in, in this country. Uh, now that I don't have to do that, I still run a business as the pet karma, but it's a, a small product, easy to ship, and highly effective. So it's given me purpose, and that's where I, I, why I get so enthusiastic about making a difference for people with their animals and anxiety, because uh, anxiety is the key issue that veterinarians, uh, the veterinary association, both this country and in the, in America have recognised anxiety as one of their leading causes to pet illness. So I'm in an area now where I feel as though I can make a little dent, you know, in that 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 space for pet owners uh, to have a really good life with their animals and also uh, try and offset some some of the animals going into rescues, mm. you know, because. You know, that's one of the issues, behaviours and how to handle them and how to live together is one of the big issues. So when you say um, I'm a, a consultant, that's what I, I do. I set up people, homes with their animals so they can live together and they can actually blossom a relationship. Okay, that's an interesting point. I, I just want to reinforce that to see if I've got that right. So the pet, the pets themselves can experience anxiety if, in their... Yes. In their uh, in their home in their yeah. home yeah if they're not sure that they're safe they feel safe what a what a what a dog and a cat value the most and a horse uh, and a bird 
And what they value the most is actually living in a safe environment, <laughs> right? And the way that they're determining their safe environment is by what they hear, what they see, and uh, and how to uh, to react to behavioural responses. So it might be environmental. Uh, maybe the start of it is somewhat environmental or the dog's been introduced and it's just the balance isn't there. But then does the anxiety flow on to the owners? Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, it flows both ways. And then, then it probably it escalates. It's probably not that a is. great scenario. And, and um, there's been a lot of work done in that area, particularly with therapy dogs. And okay. one of the reasons for the good work with therapy dogs is because dogs can calm. Now, a number of therapy dogs may be breeds like Labradors, pretty placid sort of breeds. So they can actually go into a calm state or make quick connections with their, uh, with their owners or their clients. And that actually helps people go calm as well. And you might have read that in the, on a number of other reports where uh, my dog has made me feel better. So dogs have a, a huge benefit that way. But on the other hand, you know, if dogs go into an environment that is highly um, uh, activated, highly noisy, highly stressful for them, um, they're going to get anxious and that'll trigger their owners to get into anxious to know what to do about it. Hmm. I, um, you mentioned therapy dogs. I'm not sure exactly how that comes to be. Are they? Is it coming from the medical side of things where people are... Um, it's a like a recognised treatment or some kind of companionship. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's an emotional treatment. Emotional yes. Treatment. Yes. And mm. are they in short supply? Like, is there a therapy dogs? Um, well, I, I, they they possibly can. I haven't done the figures on it, but you know, they're a very expensive item to produce. Okay, so there's a yeah. maybe a yeah, there's, a there's more hurdle. demand than supply if that's if that's what you're asking. But uh, it's the same with uh, guide dogs too. You know, they're they're uh, very expensive dogs to produce. Okay. Because takes a while for them to be trained. But, um, sorry, would you say that the therapy dogs is more, it's like a certification where? Oh, it is. Yes. There's, there's a number of organizations such as uh, Delta Dogs uh, who are uh, well recognized as trainers for therapy dogs. So people can actually nominate their own dog and be trained in uh, therapy. So uh, very, very useful for aged care or for um, autistic children. Uh, also dogs are being taught to help children read. So they've got a lot of different benefits that a dog can do, uh, use. And we're really at this time in our life only just discovering the surface of what the capabilities of dogs are in our society. That's neat. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about the, um, again, just the that balance of, you know, pets in the home and then just the care needed. And, and I was always wondering about the, uh, not the regulation, but it's mostly around if you were to be a pet owner, there's no license to be a pet owner and there's no real. Uh, well, the license you need is to own a pet, which is a oh, council yeah. license. I see. So right. there is that such a thing? Oh, yes. Well, you know, if you if you have a uh, own pets on the Gold Coast, for instance, you've got to register them with a the council. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't actually guarantee you knowing how to care for a pet. That's just for the council to know how many it has and that things are under control within its um, uh, districts I see. Uh, with animal control and animal management. But the uh, <clears throat> owning a pet, you know, does take a little bit of uh, knowledge and understanding. And what I talk about all the time is not trying to get the pets to do things, but rather educate the owners as to how the pet thinks and uh, set the house up so that it's suitable for them to actually uh, have relaxed behaviours. And when that happens, owners are relaxed and they and they start to understand how a, how a dog thinks and uh, you alleviate a lot of the problems uh, okay. with uh, animals. Okay. Um, so heading into the world of, uh, I guess, perhaps music and a bit of the benefits of music. I think adults can benefit. There's probably lots of studies on that. I'll look into it. But is that the main uh, stream of, uh, are we talking about audio and actual like uh, yes. music? Well, as, I, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the, the dogs and the cats and the horses and the birds, they use their hearing to actually determine whether they are in a safe or a threatening environment. You're right. You go over there. 
that's better. Uh, and because the uh, the dog's hearing, for instance, for, for instance, is measured over two times our hearing frequency, they hear things we do not. And in that higher frequency range are frequencies that trigger anxiety and changes of behaviour. Similarly with uh, cats, cats are even uh, three times more sensitive to sounds than what we are. And uh, they are, uh, you know, they can get a lot of anxiety and display that through bad behavior, such as uh, urination in the house, random urination or howling or screeching or wanting to, uh, to prowl or be aggressive. When a cat is aggressive, you know that it's got an anxiety issue. I remember looking at that, that graph on your website, which highlights the, the different animal species and the frequencies at which they're most sensitive. So that was quite vivid for me. And it made me think um, humans are at the low end of that scale, uh, frequencies. But then in the home, you may not be aware that there's these rogue frequencies. Do you think, uh, is a home um, liable to have like all these external frequencies coming in, whether it's like a high-pitched wine from a computer monitor or it's a mobile phone or oh, something give, like that. I'll give you an example. Yeah. You know, we, we suffer from thunderstorms. You know, we're in thunderstorm season on, on the uh, northern tropics, right? right? And uh, pet owners will probably have seen this, that when a storm is about to come, the dogs and the cats are alert. They're, all, they're, already, uh, they're already showing that there's uh, a reaction to the sounds. Their ears are up. They're pointing in a the direction, they're feeling agitated, they're uneasy. They can hear that, uh, that uh, sound that we can't. And normally it's a percussion sound, and thunderstorms are percussion sounds that trigger that behaviour. Wow. Um, yeah, well, I think that's that's all part of it. And so what you've got here is something you've been working on for for a while. He's a good, he's a good uh, product pitch, pitch, uh, pitch man. <laughs> Yes. You bring him around with you everywhere, or uh, no? No, he comes in for he comes in for daycare. So we thought we'd bring him along today because Murphy's a Murphy's a little bit of a rascal, but he's he's, he's a pretty good dog. Oh, it's been great. No, yeah. we're going to do yeah, an episode. Right. We've got a dog yeah, episode. Just, I was a bit concerned whether you would sit here for this period, but he's doing. Oh, well. he's good, and we'll we'll, we'll, yes. we'll be guided by you on that. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple studio cats for people that haven't yet picked up on that. Um, they haven't made an appearance yet, but I'm sure they'll hop up here one of these days. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, look at the theme of the, po the podcast is really just uh, hearing some interesting stories about what's happening on the Gold Coast in Queensland, in Australia, for a lot of people overseas that have not yet travelled here, or they don't, um, they're just curious about the Australian life and uh, what it's been like. But um, so yourself, you've you've started this. Uh, basically, it's not only a consultation business, but you've got products uh, to be able to support that as well. Is that um, take uh, up a lot of your time? Uh, well, yes, I, I put a lot of time into it because. Uh, uh, the product that the Pet Karma um, has on its website is called Pet Tunes. Now, this is actually a science into the hearing frequencies of the dogs and the cats, and the music's been specially produced for their hearing frequency to divert the alert frequencies that change there or cause the anxiety behaviours and put them into the calm behavioural state. So um, and I... Why I think this is uh, such a, uh, a unique uh, product is that a lot of anxiety issues are uh, tried to be solved through medications or um, um, aggressive be behavioural changes, right? Um, where there's two ways to approach anxiety. One is you actually mask the problem, medicate the dogs, or the other way is you go to the source of the problem and change the source. So that's what we've uh, we've actually done, and the music has been uh, scientifically produced and researched. It's taken seventeen years of research to do this, uh, to put the dogs into a calm state naturally and hold them into that state. So it is specially music digitalized for their um, their hearing frequency. Now the difference between this and say just playing music uh, is that. Mute. Oh, cat turned up. <laughs> is uh, is that um, music is you know you've got your wings, your strings, and your percussion instruments, okay. right? Classical music is composed of those three. Now, percussion is one of the trigger frequencies.
for agitation. So this music has been primarily produced with strings and winds and then modified again to uh, for the dog's hearing frequency and then modified for the cat's hearing frequency. And we have another one for, for the horses, which is on their, uh, their tempos. Horses have certain uh, resting tempos. Uh, that's what, uh, when you play the pet tunes, you can actually have that consistency of sound. When you play your TV, radio or such, you may have strings, but then you may have percussion too. So you're actually bringing your dog into a calm, popping him out of that, down, out, and that teaches the dog not to be in a calm state at all. Mm -hmm. How's he doing there? I don't know. I, I, think, he's, I think he wants to say something. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Good boy. No problem. Good boy, good job. Um, yeah, well, I think the uh, the amount of research and the amount of uh, supporting aspects of that is is impressive, and it's uh, I guess it's is it through the use of it, so anyone can try this. Is that the idea? Well, or do you need it through a vet to? Uh, no, no, you don't. Well, this is the beauty of it. The only thing you have to do to activate this is turn it on. So it's uh, well, well with the dog one. This this is the dog. It's a little it's a little speaker unit. Okay, there you everything's, go. Everything's everything's preloaded onto it. Rechargeable batteries, and there's a uh, toggle switch here. So you just switch that on and just and have it in the vicinity of the dog. Now, what we uh, we have blue for dogs because these are all differently uh, different music, and with the uh, the Citron color for the cats. Now with the cats, what actually happens, and it happens with the dogs, when you place it there, the cats will come and lay next to it. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they like the vibration, but they like the sound because it's actually soothing and they feel safe in this. So now we, uh, we have uh, a lot of the cat fanciers around Australia using it in their show cages because cats get highly stressed at shows. And as soon as they stress, they're eliminated from competition. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of saved the day for them. But more important is, you know, what happens at home. You know, uh, because when you go away and you have separation anxiety, well, you can just play this music and calm your dog into a uh, calm state. All right. Um, you've got two other colours. Yeah, two other colours. The uh, black one is equine. That's for horses. And um, we've done our trials here, with, uh, particularly in stables. The trial was uh, conducted, put the horse in the stable overnight, uh, two days with no pet tunes and two days with pet tunes and observed the difference. The uh, difference was when there was no pet tunes, the stables were a complete mess in the morning, which meant that the horses were agitated and walking around and kicking up the uh, straw and their droppings. Um, the day that the pet tunes was on, came in the morning, the stables were totally clean. Now that actually showed the horses actually slept that night. And that's a, that's a huge issue for horses, you know, having rest. Um, in this particular trial, and I didn't ask for it, uh, the um, trainer used it actually in the paddock. And they had a number of horses there. One of them is a Shetland pony. And if anybody wants to work with Shetlands, they can have attitude. And she hung it up in the tree. And this little Shetland did have an attitude with a couple of the other horses. But when she came back to the paddock, all the horses were actually laying on, uh, laying on the ground underneath the tree, listening to the music. So it was um, quite, a, quite an impressive result, I thought, you know, for, for doing that. The other, uh, the other one here is, the silver one, is for avian birds. Uh, birds are the most social of our uh, pet creatures, and a lot of them suffer anxiety, which is displayed by feather picking, uh, constant uh, yelling, cr uh, crowing and such, and they need other birds to talk to. So the music that's on here is mainly forest sounds of birds having a conversation. And when they're playing the, uh, the bird music, the, uh, the birds, you can actually see them. They'll just go into a relaxation mode and move up and down and then start talking to the, to the uh, speaker. So that, that's it's quite neat. interesting. That's neat. Given that this is in Australia, is there a, would this be a global 
type of a product? Like, are there Australian birds yes, on it's, here? It's it's distributed in America, okay, Europe, and uh, we've just got a distributor now, a veterinarian down in Argentina and um, Chile. Okay, well, that's where that's wide open mm -hmm. then. Um, one of the things I was just wondering about is the, I guess, the intervention timing on something like this. So if you've got a, a dog that's early in stage, like you said. Four, four weeks to 16 weeks, I think you said. So well, that's 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 early. the time you, you, you can train. Not many people train their dogs in that period, okay. but that's the time uh, they will pick up all their bad behaviours. Um, but, but the soothing aspect or the, um, the anti-anxiety effect of this, the positive effect, can happen later in life, like it can just ease... Yes, later. A age is age is not a problem. With the uh, the pet churn felines, we have a uh, cat rearing program uh, going now, where the uh, cats during mating have played the music. Uh, they are during the birth, the music is played, and during their rearing period, the music is played. One of the difficulties with cats is that when they're transferred out of the litter to their new home, they go into a, a high anxiety state. You know, and won't eat for uh, two or three days, mm -hmm. and uh, even disappear on on uh, owners. Uh, with this, the uh, the music music has actually alleviated that problem. So they're just transferring straight, and this is including air flights. Uh, they'll go into the air flight to the new home, and as soon as they get there, they're starting to eat and interact with the family. Mm. Yeah, I, I think we were chatting before a little bit about the, I guess, some of the local studies, perhaps. I think it was a Perth-based study on more of the, um, uh, another aspect of cats. Could you just highlight that? Yeah, that look, th this is this is really a, a, a new revelation for, uh, for us, is cats are actually uh, dying from uh, FIV, which is a feline immune deficiency virus, very similar to a coronavirus. And uh, it's having drastic effects on cats. And uh, the outcome up until recently has been no cure. Uh, there has been a lot of research done in that area. Um, but one of the uh, triggers for the virus is stress. And uh, the stress in the, in the kittens particularly is activating a mutation of the FIV uh, virus. And uh, to... To remedy that, there is a, a medication now. It's a vial injection that needs to be conducted every day for 84 days. And then there's an 84-day of observation period to see whether the cat has actually reached recovery stage. Now, if you've tried to inject a cat, you'll know that that's not a, an easy task. But to do it 84 days consistently has uh, caused a huge amount of stress to the owners of the cats. It's an expensive operation uh, to do, but you know, cat owners are very dedicated to their animals. So we've just now completed one trial uh, of a cat uh, contracting the uh, FIV. Uh, it was actually a delayed uh, uh, diagnosis because the previous vet didn't diagnose or recognize the, the, the symptoms. And the, uh, the cat actually, you know, bloated very hard in the stomach, couldn't eat or urinate. And the owner was highly stressed. Now, uh, we actually put a pet tune into, into that uh, cat's cage and uh, to do the injections. Now, this was in Western Australia in a remote area, and it was an hour and a half drive each way to the vet. And that was a stress for the cat to do that. So the pet churns was in the car uh, with with the cat and the owner said, you know, that cat didn't budge. It was, uh, it relaxed all the way. The day she forgot to take the pet churns was a different story. Wow. Yeah, it was different. Now, um, the uh, science papers are now actually being written for that, that particular study. And um, we'll, we'll start another one uh, fairly too in that same manner. But we also have another research program going on measuring the cat's vitals, playing music and not playing uh, the pet tunes music. Now, this is done through a special collar that actually measures the blood temperature, the heartbeat and all the vital signs and is transmitted back to a um, location in Europe where that is then documented and we can actually measure and see how the music affects the cat's internal 
um, behavior. Um, now, uh, we've completed a study on five obsidian cats in South Australia, and the results have come back that it's significantly changed their temperament to a calmer temperament. So that study is now in continuation with, an, with another cat breeder to uh, see whether we can replicate those results. Wow. Um, so we've got Australian-based research, but global connections to... Oh, technology is wonderful uh, these days. Okay. Wow, well, you're plugged into it. Um, just on that front, I mean, a lot of this, these topics would be interesting for people, pet owners, but then perhaps even specialists that are looking at behavioral oh, aspects. Oh, look, uh, it is. And um, the uh, the FI um, the is f uh, recovery is very new. Like, for instance... The medication injections were really only available mid-December. So it's not even over a month ago. Uh, so for veterinarians to come on board with that, it's going to take a little bit of time because, you know, they need research study papers and they need to be published for this too. But some of them have, uh, have uh, come forward very quickly to uh, accommodate the uh, distribution of the, uh, of the drugs. Mm. Fantastic. Um, I'm curious about how, like you mentioned the U.S. in terms of, um, I think you traveled there yes. and uh, experienced some of the things overseas. Uh, are you, is that something you do frequently, a uh, network uh, inter-country? Oh, inter uh, uh, network frequently. Yeah, don't travel frequently anymore, but uh, because we can't get out to do that. Um, but yes, yeah, always, always in, uh, looking in, to be in contact with experts. Um, and the component to the, even though this is a, uh, a passion that you've started up and now you've probably got a lot going on. Um, are there certain areas that you will be focusing on next? Like you mentioned, uh, like the trade shows can have a level of um, networking and so on. What uh, yes, we were, we were doing a number of trade shows and uh, veterinary conferences uh, in the, the past three years. Uh, they're, they're expensive operations to, uh, to, to go to the trade shows and uh, they're, they're very suitable for broadening the idea and broadening your knowledge. Um, but when COVID has came about, a lot of those were cancelled. So it's allowed us, uh, well, it's allowed me particularly to actually research other areas of how we can transmit knowledge and uh, communicate uh, with directly with pet owners who have got the, the problem. You know, like with the FIB or the FIP, as I uh, refer to it as well, you know, there are dedicated Facebook pages for people to uh, have discussions of how to handle and treat that. And I, I've, I follow those regularly to sort of see uh, where, where owners are at the moment. And really at the moment, they are, uh, you know, in a, in a pretty stressed state knowing what to do mm. uh, to help their animals. I can see the potential for sure, um, and I'm I'm just thinking of um, you know the immediate benefit would be you've got I think animal welfare leagues and existing uh, bodies and so yes, on. Yes, like the that. Uh, the animal rescue uh, unit uh, they they run their own conferences, uh, which also includes council management, animal management, uh, to uh, spread knowledge in how to uh, uh, to manage animals in shelters. And really, in the last 12 months, there's been some revolutionary changes in that area. Um, another area, too, is quarantine. So animals coming in and out of Australia have to go through quarantines. And uh, uh, the way that they're, they're managed within the quarantine services is taking um, dramatic change, too. Mm. That might just be a little bit of a fun topic for people to be aware of, so... Uh, people traveling and they want to travel with their pets. So are you up to speed on what can and can't be done in Australia or is there a certain... What do you mean traveling? If you brought your pet from overseas, I know there's been some high profile cases in the media, but people bring their pet uh, into Australia. There's a quarantine period for both the owner and the pet or is it the, uh, pet the quarantine? Owner? The quarantine is for the animal because it's a biosecurity concern, mm -hmm. right? So um, um, the, the instance uh, that happened, uh, uh, what was it, last year or the year before, um, was um, a really a deliberate avoidance, in my opinion, of following the quarantine regulations. Now, I don't think people in other countries appreciate Australia's uniqueness. You know, we are a continent surrounded by water and uh, we have a... Uh, an agricultural system uh, here, which is highly susceptible to diseases. 
And if it gets out of control, it is a huge cost to um, people like ourselves. You know, we're the, we pay the government, mm. the government pays for the cost. So uh, I'm very much pro for, uh, you know, having good, strong quarantine procedures. Now, for uh, for domestic uh, animals to come into this Australia, into Australia is generally pretty good. We've got a number of uh, organisations who actually organise the carry carrying of the animals through through the uh, airports and uh, uh, picking them up and delivering them. And I I think you know we've we've still got a lot to learn, but there's a lot of progress. You know, there's a lot of positivity within the uh, communities who are analysing this, both with Australia and, and the US. They're working together to give uh, have better services. So, and, and with technology now, that's, um, that's sort of another game changer again. That's, that's interesting. I mean, it's a unique view into the, you know, there's, there's the pet ownership and then the, the responsibilities and just the, the onward effects it's not just, uh, you know, the. It's not a simple task to to keep a happy pet, is it? Is it? Or would no, you say? But, well, I, I, as a, a, when you say it's not a simple task, it sort of is. Okay. But we make it complicated. Uh, you know, for the animal, you know, they work on their immediate environment. You know, what? You know, is it a safe environment or is it a threatening environment? And if they're unsure or they're confused, it's a threatening environment. So they'll try and work out behaviours to compensate for that. If it's a safe environment, they'll go into relaxation and and feel fairly content. Wonderful. I can see uh, Murph's just nodded off there and uh, seems pretty relaxed. So Must be my talking. You've done well. <laughs> Ron, uh, this has been great. Thank you for sharing your insights. We'd love for people to be able to follow what you what you'll be up to next. Um, is there a place where we should look? Whether it's your website or uh, yeah, look, come on, you yeah, come on the website. That's one thing. Uh, but you know, if people want to connect with me um, uh, personally, they're they're most welcome to do that. I do run a Instagram page uh, for Ron Pierre. Uh, we also have the Instagram page for the Pet Karma, Facebook page for the Pet Karma, and if uh, also LinkedIn, they can uh, find me on LinkedIn. Wonderful. I'm not so active on LinkedIn, but I'm certainly very active on the uh, the social pages of Instagram and and Facebook. Wonderful. Well, we'll definitely share those links out, and people can uh, join the conversation. I think it's just the start of the awareness for. Well, if I can, uh, if I can actually help people just to understand how to uh, communicate with their animal, that would be a big a big step for me because uh, most of the problem is just this lack of understanding. And the the, uh, the dogs particularly and the cats, they are very set in the way that they actually communicate. So once you understand that, you can alleviate a lot of these uh, anxiety issues. Beautiful. Ron Pierre, thank you very much for your time. Most welcome. Thank you for having me here. Great. 